This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good afternoon and welcome to you all. On behalf of Dean Robert Shapiro and the faculty of the law school, I want to welcome you all here for this very special occasion uh, that we are having. We're distinctly honored and pleased to have with us General John F. Kelly, Kelly, General in the U.S. Marine Corps and Commander of the U.S. Southern Command. Before formally introducing General Kelly, I want to begin by noting the presence of several distinguished guests who are with us here today. Um, we are, all, as always, pleased to have back on campus our dear friends and alums, John and Carol Dowd, uh, in helping to bring General Kelly here with us today, uh, but it was also bringing, us, bringing him to us five years ago, you have yet again found a way to add to the Emory Law community and the life of our community, and we're grateful for that. So thank you for being here. I also want to acknowledge the presence of another distinguished alum, Major Lloyd Whitaker, Marines retired, as well as his wife, Mary Ann. Thank you for being here as well. So we're grateful, grateful to all of you to be here. I also want to take a moment to note the important work of the hosts of General Kelly's visit, the International Humanitarian Law Clinic here at the law school, as well as Professor Lori Blank, who founded the clinic along with Professor Charlie Shainer and who continues to direct the clinic. The clinic uh, partners our students here at the law school with international tribunals, with militaries, with NGOs, and with other organizations to promote the law of armed conflict and to enhance its protections during wartime. Among the clinic's very closest partners is the Marine Corps, with whom the clinic partners in curricular programs, in hosting Marine Judge Advocates here on campus, and in Professor Blank's lectures at Marine Corps University. General Kelly, as well as a number of his staff, were also with us here today, and who we also are excited to have here and also want to welcome. Um, uh, General Kelly will address some of the many ways in which law has become integral and intertwined in many ways with the military and the national security mandates that it advances. In the work being done by the International Humanitarian Law Clinic, our students are lucky to see on a day-to-day -day basis that nexus between the, the important role of the military and the role of the law. And so we're grateful to the clinic and to Lori for the work she does with it. Finally, before introducing our guests, I want to also thank Associate Dean Joella Harisic and her entire staff, as well as other members of the law school staff who helped to put this event on. Um, we are incredibly excited about it, as you can see, and we're grateful to them for helping us to do that. With that, let me turn to our guest of honor. General John F. Kelly was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. He first enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1970 before returning to the University of Massachusetts for his undergraduate studies. Thereafter, he returned to the Marines, including service on the USS Forrestal and the USS Independence. He graduated from the US Army's Infantry Officer Advanced Course at Fort Benning, Georgia, after which he served at U US Marine Headquarters in Washington, DC. In 1987, he was promoted to the rank of Major and was transferred to the basic school at Quantico, where he served as an instructor for several years. Thereafter, he served as a commanding officer at Camp Pendleton before attending the National War College, being promoted to the rank of colonel, and being selected to serve as the Commandant's Liaison Officer to the House of U.S. Representatives in 1995. During the following years, General Kelly variously served as Special Assistant to the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, served in Iraq, including with the 1st Marine Division at the rank of Brigadier General. In 2008, now at the rank of Major General, he led the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force forward on a year-long tour in Iraq, including in, in, in Al-Anbar province. Thereafter, as Lieutenant General, he commanded Marine Forces Reserve and Marine Forces North in Iraq from 2009 to 2011. Today, General Kelly serves as commander of the U.S. Southern Command, among the most complex and challenging assignments in the U.S. military today. His region of responsibility encompasses Central and South America, as well as the Caribbean, including the U.S. base at Guantanamo Bay. Further, his work, the subject matter of his work, ranges widely from issues of drug interdiction and immigration to questions of economic development and, of course, national security. Let me close by saying what a personal pleasure it is for me to welcome General Kelly back to campus uh, and back to the law school. Um, while I'm quite certain that his visit in 2009 is not the sole impetus for the tremendous successes that he has had in the years since that visit, the, I can say that the law school counts its friendship with you as one of its dearest and strongest. And so thank you for being here and please join me in welcoming General Kelly to the stage. Well, thanks very much. Um, certainly an honor to be here. I, I, I do thoroughly enjoy doing uh, engagements like this. Uh, uh, I, I do them as frequently as I can. And uh, actually, just a little while ago, I was on the phone with 
former chairman of the Joint Staff, former um, uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell, who has a very close relationship with the City of College in New York. I was asking him to do me a favor, like anything you ask someone to do a favor. It's always dangerous because he immediately asked me to do uh, him a favor, but uh, I'm going to go up and do this at the at City of College. So I really thoroughly do, do enjoy uh, this. Um, a few opening comments. You know, I, I, uh, I got to tell you a story. Uh, Secretary Kerry, my, my former senator, uh, came over to see all of the four-star generals in the U.S. military uh, a few months ago over at the Pentagon. And we were all up there, and he was going to uh, do kind of what I'm about to do. And uh, what he started by saying was, look, I'm, uh, the best part of this is going to be the Q&A. So let me just make a very few couple of comments, and then we'll go right to Q&A. And he spoke for 58 minutes. <laughs> took one very, very uncomfortable question and headed for the door. So um, <clears throat> for those of you that don't know, U.S. Southern Command, the United States uh, has, uh, looks at the world in, in five distinct uh, geographical regions, one of them being Latin America, that's where I live, Caribbean, everything in the Western Hemisphere with the exception of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. So everything else, Caribbean, all the way down to, I actually have a sliver of Antarctica. Uh, no one lives there, but, you know, the, the, I own it, I guess, so I'm responsible for it. Um, Africa is another region. Uh, central, uh, uh, the Central Command, which is Middle East, that's another region. Uh, Europe, and then finally the Pacific Command. Uh, so there's a four-star general in charge, not in charge, that inter interacts with each one of those. And that's the way we've uh, parceled up the world. Um, and as, uh, as was mentioned, I also own Guantanamo Bay. Uh, I am responsible to the President of the United States for detention operations there. We can talk about that. I do not do the commissions, the, the law part of it, but I do, I do support that part of it. I'm very, very happy to, uh, to talk to you about Guantanamo Bay. Uh, before I get uh, into, the, into the main part of the comments about Guantanamo Bay, uh, I, would have to, I would tell you right now that anything you have read negative about Guantanamo Bay from a detention operations point of view, excuse me, is wrong and it has been delivered to you by a very agenda-driven press. I don't know why, but I know what goes on down there. I know what has gone on down there. I've got 2,000, roughly, U.S. military personnel that run an extremely good detention facility. Uh, they treat the, deten the detainees with dignity, with respect, uh, and I would tell you they have, the, they have first class care, first class medical care, certainly better, better medical, medical care than we have in our VA facilities for our, fall, uh, for our wounded warriors. It's, it's a good news story from how it's run inside. We can, uh, and, and uh, people like you will argue about the legality of it or should we have done it in the first place or whatever, but at the end of the day, uh, I can tell you that the, uh, the uh, detention facility is run uh, with the utmost in dignity and, and humane care for the, for the various, uh, for the 122 uh, detainees that we have down there right now, and we can get into that. Uh, part of the mission down there, of course, is I support the military commissions. Uh, you probably know more about it than I do. M military commissions date all the way back to uh, George Washington. Um, there's times we've used military commissions, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, there's, I guess, a lot of what you would term case law and, and those kind of things. We, we can talk about that. I don't know much about that part of it, but I have a couple of lawyers with me. Uh, I don't go anywhere, by the way, without a lawyer in my back pocket. And uh, I've got one in each back pocket today, uh, just in case kind of the, 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 those kind of questions come up. Uh, but uh, again, uh, commissions, I support them, and they're ongoing. And um, uh, we'll, we'll let that go to the Q&A, maybe. Um, Latin America and Caribbean. I, I spoke to a class uh, here just a few minutes ago, so some of this will be repetitive. But you know, at the, at the end of the day, the good news is in Latin America is that there are very few uh, really remote possibility of a state-on-state -state war and certainly a, a, an attack against the United States military attack. But I am charged by the President to protect the Southern approaches of the United States from threats. And um, I generally don't uh, don't have an awful lot of military forces assigned. I don't need a lot of military forces assigned. We do most of our work in Latin America by working with our partners as an equal partner. Um, our special relationship uh, beyond all others is with Colombia. They're a fascinating and tremendous group of men and women as a, as a people. Uh, but we have great relationships with Chile, with Panama, with all the countries, with the exception of a few. Good news story, again, another part of the good news story, no state-on-state -state conflict, no real military threat to the United States. 
a, a, another kind of terrible threat, and that is the drug threat, and we can talk about that in a few, you know, again uh, in a few minutes. Um, but the, uh, we do all of our work through, through partnering, with na partnering with nations as equals, and I give a lot of uh, information, I provide a lot of intelligence, I provide a lot of advice, I provide a lot of training, but I don't really provide any, any boots on the ground, no, nor do I need those kind of things, nor in most cases uh, do, they, do they want that kind of thing. Um, but the, uh, in democracy, to a very, very large degree, has taken hold. Now there's, a, there's a, a, an alarming trend in my mind that for the last 10, 15 years, democracy has really done, has really grown tremendously in, in Latin America, but we've seen a, a recent phenomenon where in some cases, Venezuela as an example, having voted in a leader democratically uh, in his other nations, but having voted in a leader democratically and then allowed that leader to essentially dismantle democracy, dismantle free press, dismantle an awful lot of things till we have uh, what we have today uh, as we watch uh, kind of Venezuela uh, struggle towards uh, some end that probably will not be a good news story. Um, I talked about other threats in my part of the world. Really, the biggest threat is, is a very, very efficient network of movement from around the world. It's a global network uh, and moves up through my part of the world, the Western Hemisphere, generally up into uh, Mexico and into the United States. It's an exceptionally uh, well-run and exceptional, uh, an exceptionally sophisticated network. Uh, I oftentimes say it's, it's as, it's as uh, efficient and as uh, and as efficient as a FedEx or something like that. I actually gave this, made this comment once, and it was an official or a, 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 a uh, yeah, you know, one of the one of the board members or something like that of FedEx, who immediately took me to task on using that as an example. And I said, well, actually, you're right. This network that I deal with is actually more efficient uh, than than FedEx. Um, but it is extremely efficient. And what rides on this network? And this is the dangerous part of it. What rides on it? Anything that wants to ride on it can ride on it. Hundreds and hundreds of tons of drugs. That's cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin. All rides into the United States. Um, seven, the UN tells us 17,500 sex workers a year, mostly young women, mid-range adolescent girls really, move on that network. Last year, 68,000 unaccompanied children, uh, some of them as young as two or three years old, being carried by their older sister or brother who is 12 or 15 years old. 68,000 made it into the United States. Another half million uh, moved on that network, um, and uh, many of them got into the United States. So just think of this network as a very, very, very dangerous, and anything can ride on it. I, uh, in my congressional hearings, I'm oftentimes asked, well, how about terrorists carrying a, a dirty you know, a nuclear material or a small bomb or something like that? And I said, yep, I mean, that's, anything that's got the money can ride on the network. And it starts around the world. If you want to get to the United States, you can enter the network. It's, it's, it's disorganized, but it's connected to, to a degree that if you want to, you buy your way onto the network. And if you're in, in Pakistan, as an example, and maybe you want to come here and just have a better life, you can pay onto the network, and you will get into the United States. Uh, you can almost guarantee it. The issue of, of, say, someone traveling from as far away as Pakistan, you will pay a lot of money to get to travel from that distance. So the average person that is coming in, we call them aliens of interest, who pay a huge amount of money to guarantee entry through this network, they're not the kind of people that are coming here to drive a cab in Atlanta and have a better life. There's something nefarious about them. And a fair amount of them, we track them fairly well, but a fair amount of them get into the country. And we can talk about that. Um, drug terrorism overlap. We know that this ter Islamic terrorist uh, seething organization, very now metastasize around the world, needs large amounts of funding. They used to get it from contributions from Middle Eastern uh, uh, countries. Uh, that, to a large degree, has dried up. Uh, now they, they're, they're doing it in very various ways. We see them entering, getting in cahoots, if you will, with drug traffickers. Uh, there's a, an amazing amount of money that comes out of our country, about $85 billion a year, cocaine. The biggest problem these cartels, this network has, is not getting things into the United States, it's laundering the money that comes out. I mentioned in the class a little while ago, when, when we get money at Southcom, we don't count it, we weigh it. You just think of a ton of money, or 900 pounds of money. 
you know, U.S. currency, and they're all, of course, you know, 10s and 20s and 50s. Tremendous amount of money. We know that some of the laundering is done by banks in the hemisphere that have connections with radical terrorist organizations in the Middle East, and they take a, a certain share, a, a, a fee for doing that, for doing that processing. Uh, we know that the cocaine that goes to the rest of the world comes out of primarily Peru and, um, and Bolivia, out through Argentina, uh, or the southern, the southern route, Argentina and Bolivia, uh, Brazil, makes, it, makes its way to Africa, uh, and then up through Africa into the, into the markets of the Western Hemisphere or Asia. Uh, it'll come all the way around to Asia. We know Islamic uh, extremist organization, Al-Qaeda affiliates as an example, allow it to move and they take their fee for allowing it to move. Uh, so ironically, the recreational use of drugs in the United States is actually funding to some degree or another uh, international terrorism, Islamic terrorism, directed, again, against us. Uh, and, and again, very, very few people uh, appreciate that, but I do, it's my life. Um, we talked about the, the, the relative ease of a movement of people. Again, I go back to the sex industry, the, the movement of these young people, mostly young girls, 13, 15, 17, into our country. Uh, I mean, it's, and of course, they don't know they're coming here for that purpose, but they come here and then get pushed almost as slaves into, this, into the sex industry, and who knows what happens to them uh, over time. Um, talked a little bit about the convergence of the nexus of uh, terrorism and um, in this, this, uh, uh, this network, this narco-terrorist network. Uh, maybe talk just a bit about uh, a couple of, these are the two countries that are probably most in the news right now, Cuba. Our president uh, has uh, decided to end, uh, to change the relationship between us, our country, and, the United, and, and Cuba. By law, I don't uh, interact with Cuba at all. Um, the U.S. Coast Guard does to, to a fair degree, mostly on uh, migratory issues and uh, disaster relief and that kind of thing. So I don't deal with them by law. Over time, I suppose I will. Uh, but that was a decision, again, uh, to change the relationship. One thing that, to note about Cuba, it has got the worst uh, human rights <clears throat> record in the, in the hemisphere, bar none. It's a repressive regime. It, there's no freedoms that we understand as, as freedoms. I'm not by any means saying we shouldn't do what the president has us doing, but this will be somewhat of a long road ahead. Uh, their economy is absolutely the worst in, in the region, uh, although Venezuela is getting close. Uh, and remember this, though, uh, the fact is that I think there's 197 nations on the face of the planet. One of them doesn't trade with, uh, with Cuba, only one, and that's us. So the Cubans have access to everything else. High tech, agricultural, doesn't matter. Have high, has uh, access to everything. Uh, and their economy, again, because it's a socialist economy, a, de a uh, controlled economy, uh, they didn't get the memo about these, these kind of economies don't work. You know, they, I guess they missed the point when the Soviet Union collapsed. I guess they, and they just haven't adjusted. Uh, but they blame us. And the good news is, from my perspective now, they can no longer blame us for their economic problems. And now it's up to them, and I don't think they're going to do very well at it, but it's up to them to then say, okay, you're right. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to fix human rights. We're going to give our citizens freedom. We're going to have a, an open press. We're going to have an open society, but that's up to them. I believe over time that will happen. Um, but the immediate change is only that we're in negotiations for further change. Venezuela, you know, it's, it's a really a, a tragedy, I think. Venezuela's got more oil reserves in Saudi Arabia. Um, it's, uh, if you go to Caracas or any of the, the, any of the places there now, there, are, there is nothing on the shelves. People are not starving to de death yet. There's nothing on the shelves. The thing, uh, uh, there's a lot of Venezuelans in Miami, a lot of them that come to events that we do, ask them, what is the thing that you send home the most? Toilet paper. It, it keeps coming up over and over and over again. There is no toilet paper in the country that sits atop the largest oil reserves on the planet. It's so mismanaged. And the reaction to the difficulties they're having is, uh, rather than seek the help of the world community, economic community, that kind of thing, is to repress at least one half, the, about 49% of the population, which is the opposition. Uh, I don't have much hope for them. I, have a, I, I think about them a lot. Uh, I certainly wish them well. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're going to have to fix themselves. Uh, I'm asked all the time about you know, coups and people taking over. 
I don't know. The, the current president is duly elected. He's legally elected. Um, he does a very, very, very good job repressing the opposition. And when I say the opposition, it's just like the other party, but they, they term it the opposition. Uh, who knows where it will go, um, but uh, I don't have any really, I'm not optimistic in, in the short term that things will get any better there. And if you, if you look at Miami, which is, uh, anyone from Miami? There you go. I mean, Miami is to a very, very large degree. In fact, the, the thing down there is what? It's the capital of South America, Miami. Another thing people will say is it's the, it's the largest Latin American city to the United States. It's a very, very Latinized city. Consequently, there's large numbers of people that come up from in vacation there, have second homes there. There's a huge real estate boom where the Venezuelan, that people that have money over the last few years have gotten it out by buying real estate on South Beach, Miami Beach, places like that. And you can see it every day. Um, so I don't, uh, as I said, we, we, I, I watch Venezuela and I, I guess I pray. And the, the last thing I would say, and it's, it's just something that uh, I'd like to, to share with, with groups. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a very small number of people that, uh, that serve in the U.S. military. This is not a recruiting pitch, by the way, but there's a very, very small number of people that serve in the U.S. military. About 1% of our population is in uniform right now. Um, that's a very, very low percentage. The good news is we have a tremendously capable, tremendously educated, tremendously moral, tr tremendously professional military service. The number one, the most admired, most respected institution in the United States and has been for decades is the U.S. military. Um, my pitch is not to join the military. My pitch is to serve your country in, in some way. Uh, and there are many, many ways to do it. Um, and that might be simply being a good citizen, uh, paying your taxes, uh, not, uh, not whining when you, uh, when you get called up for court duty. Uh, just do something to be part of this really, really great nation. Welcome immigrants. Uh, many of you, all of you, I, I suppose, hope to be lawyers someday. Carve some time out to represent people that can't afford your representation. Uh, there's ways to do this, but the, the last thing, th this, our wonderful country will not survive in, in the way that we know and love it unless we get people, our citizens, more and more involved in the in the day-to-day -day running. And it's too important to be left to politicians in Washington. Uh, it's too important to be left to one, you know, one or two political parties. So that's just just a pitch. Now, if you do decide to serve, um, it's a great lifestyle. Whether it's uh, four years or, in my case, a lot longer. Uh, they're the finest men and women on earth uh, that have worn this uniform or are in this uniform today. Uh, and you can bet every single day when you're here in, in the United States, there are men and women, the most dedicated folks, I think, that come out of our society that are deployed all over the world doing what the President of the United States tells them to do and to protect uh, this country. I'll, I'll finish. There are other groups of professionals as well, and there's a lot of work to be done out of uniform. We have intelligence agencies and the like that prevent probably a 9-11 type attack against this country at least certainly monthly if not weekly. They never get to the point where they can get the airliner to crash into a, to a tower. They never get to the point where they can smuggle in material through the network I've described because we find them, we fix them, and we either destroy them or the, our partner nations overseas will arrest them and, uh, and, and, and deal with them as criminals. So think of that as well. There are, there are the, the government service, public service, is to me the most honorable thing that a, a man or woman can do, and uh, there's many ways to do it. And I wish, I mean, with that, I think I'll just end, and that wasn't too bad, I guess, and, and open it up for questions.